Good evening. So good to see everybody here tonight. The B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that is the book for me. I stand alone upon the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. That's the kind of spirit that God wants us to have in regards to His Word, as we view His Word as a source of, of life, a spring of life that brings healing and peace uh, and, and salvation uh, to everyone that submits to it, to everyone that, that believes it. And to have this spirit that I'm going to submit to and obey the B-I-B-L-E no matter what. And that's what our text tonight is all about in the book of Mark. Tonight we're going to be in Mark chapter 7. We're going to look at verses 1 through 13. So if you would take out your Bible there with me and turn to the book of Mark chapter 7. We're going to start in verse 1. Now before we begin in the first uh, verse of Mark chapter 7, let's back up just a little bit because it gives us some context of, um, of our passage tonight. Let's look at chapter 6 verses 53 through 56 because that kind of sets the stage for chapter 7. Let's look in verse 53. This is verse 53 of Mark chapter 6. When they had crossed over, they came to, the, uh, to, to land at uh, Gennesaret and moored to the shore. And when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him and ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he came in villages, cities, or countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. So at this point in Jesus' ministry, his fame is growing. His fame is spreading throughout the region of Galilee. And not even Galilee, but even farther down south into Jerusalem. And we'll see that here in a moment. Uh, but people are hearing about him. And people are flocking to him when they hear that he's in their region. People are coming to him from everywhere. They're coming him to lay their sick down at his feet so that they might be healed, so that they might experience blessing and healing. Uh, we can see that Jesus, he's, he's a beacon of hope. He's a beacon of light to a world that's sick. Uh, they're, and they're, they're coming to him, they're flocking to him so that they may be, so, so that they may be made well. And they, they beg, uh, as this text says, to touch even the fringe of his garment. Just, the, just, just a piece of his clothes uh, because they're, they're desperate. They're desperate. They're desperately sick. And he's their only hope, both to be made well physically and to be made well spiritually. And we'll see that as the book plays out further. However, not everyone comes to him to be made well. And that's what we see in the first verse of Mark chapter 7. Look with me there. Now when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem. So remember previously in Mark that the, the scribes and the Pharisees, they're questioning Jesus and his ministry. Uh, and they begin to speak out against his ministry. Jesus begins to face opposition from the scribes, the teachers of the law, uh, and, the, and, 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 and the Pharisees. I remember in Mark chapter 2, extending to the first part of chapter 3, that was when Jesus began to face this kind of opposition. We looked at that several, several weeks ago. I remember in chapter 2 that they accused him, the scribes did, they accused him of blaspheming the name of God. They said, they said to him, who can forgive sins but God alone? After Jesus, uh, having uh, divine authority, um, forgives the paralytic man's sins. Uh, they, question his, his, they question this authority and they accuse him of blasphemy. I remember also that they accused him of, of giving a, a free pass to sinners. Uh, they question him and say, you know, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners and the undesirable of society? and try to discredit him there. They accused him of, of breaking the law of Moses. When his disciples begin to pluck heads of grain on the Sabbath day, they say, look, why are they doing what's not lawful to do on the Sabbath? And they also accused him of, uh, of, of doing his mighty works, his, his uh, exercising demons and healings by the power of Satan himself. They said, look, he's possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons does he cast out the demons. And now in Mark chapter 7, we see things 
start to escalate even further. Jesus is facing even more opposition than he had previously. The Pharisees and the scribes, they come all the way from Jerusalem, the text says. And if you look at a map, you can see that Jerusalem is roughly about 75 miles away from uh, the northern shore of Galilee, where Jesus is at at the present. And they're looking for something. They're going to Jesus. They're traveling this a long way to get to him. And they're looking to find something in his life and in his teaching. They're looking for some kind of crack. They're looking for some kind of error within his uh, motives, within his teaching. They're, they're looking for something that they can use to destroy his credibility and render him powerless. So he stops doing all this stuff and causing all this commotion and teaching all of this false doctrine uh, within the region. And this, is, uh, and, 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 uh, and this is what they find as a way to destroy Jesus, as we see in verse 2 of Mark chapter 7. This is their, their scheme. Look in verse 2. They, the Pharisees and scribes, saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. And then in verse 3 it says in parentheses, for the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless, unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they watch, wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches, etc. So, the Pharisees here and the scribes, they go all the way to Galilee, where Jesus is currently located, to find something against him. And, and this is what they find. This is what they see to try to discredit him. They saw that some of his disciples, they're eating with unwashed hands. They're eating with defiled hands. Now, that might seem kind of silly uh, to a non-Jewish reader, and it's more than likely that Mark's audience is non-Jewish, and that's probably uh, why he inserts this parenthetical statement in verse 3. And you see verse 3 um, extending into verse 4. You see it, in, it it's, it's in, in, in the SV, it's in parentheses. Um, but uh, it, Mark adds this parenthetical statement as kind of like a commentary, like a background. He's trying to help us to understand what's happening and the Pharisees and scribes reasoning here and, and what these things mean. Uh, th this kind of washing uh, that's referred to in the text here in verse 2, it, it has, you know, we think of washing our hands. Why do we wash our hands before we eat? Well, we do that because of uh, hygiene reasons, right? We don't want to get sick. We want to wash all the germs off of our hands. Uh, before we eat. It, it, it's for hygiene purposes, whenever we wash our hands. Uh, but that's not the purpose that the, uh, that the Jews would wash their hands. Uh, it, it has nothing to do with hygiene necessarily, but with ceremonial cleanliness, rather. Uh, the Jews in Jesus' day, uh, they, they had this tradition. They would hold up their hands before they ate and someone would pour a jar of water over their hands and it would run down their hand and on, onto the wrist and then drip down on the ground and then they would turn their hands downward and do the same thing someone would pour water on their hands and the water would drip down their hands and then drip drip on the drip on the floor and then they would take their hands and they would rub them together uh, and, and that, was, that, that was just so that they could be ceremonially clean. Um, that was just in case, you know, they had touched something accidentally that they didn't know of uh, that, uh, so that they wouldn't be defiled, so that they wouldn't be rendered unclean. Um, now, they had this tradition. Now, now to a Jew, um, that would seem like a pretty good idea. It would seem like, you know, you know why, not? why not do that? Let, let's, let's do this just in case we accidentally uh, touch something unclean so we won't defile ourselves, um, as you see within the law of, of Moses. It sounds like a good idea. It sounds like a good tradition, but there's a problem. There's a problem with that. The washing of hands, it has nothing to do with the Word of God. 
It's not in the law of Moses. Uh, the scribes and Pharisees, they took their traditions and their laws and their commandments and they placed them on the same level as the Word of God. And that's what we see within this passage. And, uh, and, and, uh, and so, look, so, so look down with me in verse 5. Verse 5 of Mark chapter 7. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? Okay, so here's their chance. Here's their chance. Here's their opportunity to discredit Jesus. Here's their opportunity to pounce upon Jesus and uh, show, show everybody around him, look, he's a lawbreaker. He's not following uh, the commands of God. He shouldn't be listened to. He should be cast out and stoned. Uh, look, um, and, and, this, and this is what they come to him, to him with. But then, it's, in, it's interesting, Jesus, he turns the tables on them in this accusation and exposes their hypocrisy. Look with me in verse 6. Verse 6 and 7. And he said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of of men. Now, they try to discredit Jesus here, but Jesus turns the tables back on them and uses their own accusation to discredit them. And Jesus essentially says here, you know, Pharisees and scribes, you guys are like stage actors. You guys are like hypocrites. You claim to honor God, but your hearts are far from God because you care so much more about your own words, your own traditions, your own commandments than you do the word of God. Notice Jesus' statement in verse 8 and 9. Jesus uh, ac accusing the scribes and Pharisees, turning the tables on their accusation. He says, you leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way, a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. If you look in the New American Standard Translation, you'll see that uh, when, what the, the, the way that the ESV renders, you have a fine way, the New American Standard, Standard renders that as experts. Uh, Jesus is saying, you're experts. You are experts at rejecting the commandments of God. You know how to do it. You know how to do it with cunning and craft. You are experts at taking the word of God and twisting it and contorting it to suit your own pleasures, to suit your own desires, so that you may be benefited and blessed rather than, than, than God be glorified, Jesus says. So Jesus accuses them of taking their tradition, like hand washing here and elevating them amongst other things over and above the word of God thus making it void and this is the example that he uses in verse 10 Jesus says for Moses said he said this this is this is how you do this Pharisees and scribes this is how you distort the word of God for Moses said this is what the law of Moses says in verse 10 Honor your father and your mother. Honor your parents. And whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. That's, the, what, that's what the Word of God says. That's what the Bible says. Honor your father and mother. Honor your parents. Now, what does that mean? How do you honor your father and your mother? According to Jewish law, well, number, there are many ways that you can apply this. Number one, you obey them in childhood. You do what they tell you to do without complaining, without grumbling. It's one way you honor your father and mother. You also honor your, you honor your father and mother by showing them attention when you get into adulthood. Uh, you honor your father and mother by letting them know um, that They've had an impact on your life, how much they have done for you. 
Um, and that's what uh, I believe parents need. Parents need. Parents have this ha- have this need to know that they had an impact on their child's life. And a part of honoring your parents, a part of honoring your father and mother, is being grateful for the service that they have given to you, for the upbringing and care that they have displayed in your life. And not only does it mean that, but it also means, and this is, uh, this is according to, uh, um, to, to Jewish tradition for sure, uh, to honor your father and mo- mother, it means that you take care of them when they're old. Why? Because they took care of you when you were young. All those dirty diapers that they changed, all those uh, meals that they fed you, all that money that they spent because of you. When they get old and they can't take care of themselves and, and, and they need somebody to minister to them the same way that they did to you, to honor them means that you do the same to them. To take care of them when they can't take care of themselves. When they reach an age uh, where, where they can't take care of themselves. That's what it means to honor your father and, and your mother. However, doing all of that, it can be kind of difficult, right? It can, be, it can be difficult to honor your father and mother. You know, sometimes I don't want to obey my parents. I don't want to do what they tell me to do. It's hard. Sometimes, you know, I, I, I don't want to take the time out of my busy schedule and out of my daily life to show my parents attention. And sometimes I don't want to have to sacrifice to take care of them when they get old. That might take away a lot of things for me. That might take away from my time and my money to have to take care of them when they can't take care of of themselves. Now, honoring your father and your mother, it's uh, the, the way that God commands, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult now, and it was difficult back then in Jesus' day. So, the Pharisees, they made a masterful plan to get around having to do it. And this is what they did. Look in verse 11 of chapter 7. Jesus says to them, but you say, this is how they twist and contort the word of God, but you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you would have gained from me is Corban, that is given to God, another parenthetical statement. Verse 12, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother. And following the context is, when they get old and can't take care of themselves. So the Pharisees and the scribes and and the and 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 all that group, they said they say in their hearts, honoring your parents, honoring your father and your mother, it's really hard. It's difficult sometimes. So hmm, how can we get around that? How can we get around it? Corbin. Genius. Corbin. What's that? What's the Corbin? When your parents get old, they require a, uh, a lot of care. They require a lot of financial care. And in Jewish tradition, all the funds that you would have used to take care of your parents, it could be declared Corbin. That is legally dedicated to God and placed in something like the temple treasury. And that would release you from the obligation to take care of your parents. So if you wanted to get out of this, if you wanted to, your parents are starting to get old and, oh, I just don't, mm, I don't want to spend all that time and all that, all that, all that energy. I'll just take a portion of the money that I would have used to take care of them and I'm going to say you know what this is God's money this is for God this is Corbin I'm going to dedicate this to God therefore that would release you from the obligation to take care of your father and mother this is the tradition that they had this is the tradition of the elders and then Jesus says this concerning that in verse 13 thus making void the word of God by your tradition 
that you've handed down and many such things you do. So Jesus, here in this text, he's exposing the horrendous hypocrisy of the scribes and the Pharisees who take the Word of God, who, who, who profess to love the Word of God, who profess to love God outwardly, but inside they'd rather define right and wrong and good and evil based upon how they see fit. So they take the Word of God and they find a way around it. They find a way to uh, suit their own passions and their pleasures rather than following the Word of God. And honoring your father and mother is just one example of that. So, what's the message that we draw from this? What can we learn uh, from this story in Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 13? I believe that the first and foremost, the first fundamental element of true discipleship, if you want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, give him your heart, give him your life, Give him your everything. The first and foremost element of discipleship is possessing a spirit that elevates the word of God and is committed to obeying it no matter what. Like the psalmist in Psalm 119, starting in verse 97, the psalmist says, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies. For it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers. For your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged. For I keep your precepts. I hold back my feet from every evil way. In order to keep your word I don't turn aside from your rules, for you have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Though your precept, through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. That's the fundamental first element of what it takes to be a disciple of Jesus, to take the Word of God and elevate it to a position of superior importance in your life and commit to obeying it no matter what it takes and no matter the cost. Many people today um, are the same way uh, that the scribes and Pharisees. Uh, they're, they're, they, they behave just like the scribes and Pharisees concerning God's law. They're, they're experts, experts at rejecting the commandment of God. Even in our own fellowship, um, there, there, there are those who um, argue for the legitimacy of homosexual marriage, twisting Greek words, twisting the word of God, making it sound okay, just to follow suit with the culture, just to, just, just, just to appease people and make, uh, and, 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 and rendering the word of God void. Um, there are also those in, in our fellowship that uh, don't uh, exalt or teach male leadership uh, with, within, within church, with, within, the, within, the, within the assembly. Um, and I think that falls within this category. Uh, experts um, at taking the word of God and contorting it and twisting it to fit the culture, to fit your desires, to fit your needs. We don't need to be like that, church. If we want to be disciples of Jesus Christ, we need to look at this word, this law, and love it. Love it so much that we're going to obey it and do what it says, no matter what it takes, because we have this belief that it and only it is, brings life and healing and blessing and real satisfaction when we submit to God's laws and we, when we submit to his precepts and when we, when, we, when we attempt to become like Jesus. Satan doesn't mind at all if you carry a Bible around. He doesn't even mind if you come to church and hear the word of God. But he minds if you take the word of God and exalt it in your life and place it at a position 
of superior importance, more so than anything else. The B-I-B-L-E, yes, that is the book for me. And we as disciples of Jesus are ones that exalt the Word, who look at the Word as a source of life, as a source of healing, and as a source that brings satisfaction through Jesus Christ. So I encourage you to view God's Word that way. Live in submission to Him every single day, not as a, a chore to be done, not as just a check in your box, um, check in your Christian duty box, uh, but as the source that brings life and the only source. Uh, tonight, if anyone has any need, we urge you um, to come forward and make that known. Um, also, we, we always extend an invitation if there are those who have not embraced Jesus Christ, you can do so tonight. Um, you can look at this Jesus and see him in all of his beauty and believe in his name and repent of your sins and come forward and confess your faith in him and be immersed in waters uh, for the forgiveness of your sins. And that's, that's the beginning point. That's the, begin, the beginning point of a relationship with Jesus Christ. If anyone has any need, why don't they come forward tonight as we stand and as we sing.